Hi, this is Natalie. Thank you for listening to Crossroads Church, where we are bringing a real God to real people. I believe you'll be inspired by today's message. Well, good morning. How's everybody? Good. Well, I'm Joelle. I'm the teaching guy here. And I'm honored to serve under our senior pastors, Marcus and Natalie Avalos. And we are going to continue our series today. This is actually the home stretch, y'all. We will have made it through the book of Philippians by the end of August. This whole summer, we've been going through the book of Philippians verse by verse. Philippians is called the book of joy. It was written by the apostle Paul from a prison cell, which is kind of ironic because he's trying to show us that you can be in the middle of what seems like a prison, but joy doesn't have anything to do with what's going on around you. Joy starts right in here. And you can find joy and peace and confidence in the Lord no matter what's going on around you. And it's real stuff. This is like in the trench warfare stuff that we're learning. And what we're going to talk about today is I think really in the trench warfare. It's a challenging thing, but I think if you'll apply this, it could really change everything for you. Y'all ready? So when I was in my early 20s, I was attending a college group, and the college pastor got up one day, and he announced that he was going to climb Mount Kilimanjaro, which is the highest peak in Africa. It's 19,340-something feet. It's the highest standing mountain, in, a freestanding mountain in the world that's not attached to a mountain range. And he said, I'm going to go climb it, and I was like, I want to do that. Now, had I ever done anything like that? No. But I was young and stupid and arrogant, so I went up to him. I was like, hey, I'm going to go with you. And he's like, okay, you can come with me. Didn't get any preparation, didn't do a whole lot of research. I knew I needed to train like crazy, so I got into the best physical shape I had been in my entire life. And I met with him, and he, we, our team got together one night, and he gave us a cool T-shirt with a logo on it. And we're like, all right, we're going to climb Mount Kilimanjaro. And I'll never forget when we were landing in Tanzania, a little town called, uh, well, it's outside of Arusha. It's Kilimanjaro International Airport. This is what you see. This giant mountain. Kilimanjaro is actually a volcano up at the top. There's actually multiple craters. Giant, 19,340 feet. For perspective, 5,000 feet is a mile, right? So this is about four miles high. It's no joke. Again, did I have any business climbing that? Absolutely not. But I was stupid. So we got there, and I remember thinking, man, I'm ready for this. Like, I'm in the best shape of my life. I have been training. And the guy next to me who was on our team, he looked at it, and he was like, man, I am really worried about being able to get to the top of that. And I, I kind of laughed inside. I was like, <laughs> <laughs> poor guy, poor guy. Must be sad to be that pathetic. And I remember talking to our team leader. I was like, hey man, he's nervous about not being able to make it. And he's like, well, he should be nervous. A lot of people don't make it. And I was like, what do you mean a lot of don't people don't make it? He's like, well, man, if you get altitude sickness, it's done. I didn't know anything about altitude sickness. AMS, acute mountain sickness. Some of you have felt it. You get up to maybe 6,000, 8,000, 10,000, 14,000 feet, and it will take you out. Like, and once you get it, the only answer is to get down. You cannot get better from it, okay? So uh, I was like, oh, I, yeah, well, it'll be all right. You know, not going to hit me. I'm young and invincible. So we started hiking. First day was great. I felt like a rock star. Second day, awesome. Felt super strong. Third day, I was on top of the world, man. That's literally me. That's a me picture of me looking out at the world. That was the last day I remember being happy on that mountain. Because <laughs> the next day, I got up, and our guide called us together. His name was Benjamin. He was a ginormous African dude. He had done this hike hundreds, of, if not thousands of times. And he got us together, and he said, you must go slow today. Pole, pole. Pole means slow. You must go pole pole today. It's very hard if you're not. I was like, all right, well, whatever, you know. And he's like, and you must drink lots of water. I was like, okay. And I was like, I hated drinking water because then, like, you have to pee on the trail and everybody's, like, hiking past you and you're like, what's up, man? <laughs> so, you know, I bolt out of camp. And the guy yells, like, Joel, pole pole. And I was like, I'm Joel. I don't need a pole pole. After lunch, I ate some lunch. Immediately it hit me. I went to behind a rock and I threw up. And our guide, man, he was trained to hear, uh, probably the sound of vomiting because he'd heard it so much. But he came to me and said, Joel, that's not good. And I was like, oh, I'll be fine. I'll be fine. He's like, no, you must go pole pole and drink lots of water. Or you will get altitude sickness. Now, what's interesting about these guys, you know, we have, we show up at these hikes with tons of gear. Like I had, you know, $300 pants and all the cool hiking 
gear and all this stuff. I had the backpack and stuff. These dudes are doing it in like cut off shorts in flip flops, smoking a cigarette at 16,000 feet. And we're all like, <sighs> and we look so hardcore and they're like, hey, you're doing good, man. Yeah, and they're carrying 40 pounds of backpacks because they haul all the gear up for us. So we look all hardcore in the pictures, but there's these dudes, these amazing African guides. Benjamin was one of them. Well, we, by the time we got to camp, I was throwing up profusely. There was nothing left in my stomach, and Benjamin said, you must go down. And I was like, no, Benjamin, I want to finish the hike. It's just right there. I can see it. And he's like, no, it's too late. You can't get better. You must go down. I was like, no. So that night... He sent a guide with me, and for the next six hours, we hiked. I hiked through the night with just a little headlamp to guide my way, every 40 steps, stopping to vomit, whatever was left in my stomach. And we finally got down to about 12,000 feet, and I literally felt something click in, and they gave me something to eat, and I was able to actually hold it down. I was like, (sighs) but the next day, while all of my friends were summiting to the peak, I was walking the walk of shame down the mountain because I had failed in that mountain. And I'll tell you what, man, that was a very humbling experience for me. And I I realized a bunch of stuff on that that I want to talk about today on that journey, because if you look at life, honestly, I think life is kind of like climbing a mountain. You think about last week, the Apostle Paul, we looked at the verse last week where Apostle Paul said this, one thing I do, I forget what's behind and strain towards what's ahead. I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. If you didn't hear the message last week, I'd encourage you to go back and listen to it on the website or the app. We talked about this idea of perpetual ascent. The goal of the Christian life to be, is, should be to always be moving forward and up, always pressing on to be more of who God says we can be, forgetting what's behind. There's things we need to dive to and let go of, and we press on to be more of who God says we can be. And the Christian life is always about moving forward. And it doesn't matter how slow you go as long as you don't stop. And if you keep pressing forward, he who began a good work in you, it says, will be faithful to complete it. But lots of times what happens, I've been on a lot of mountains that they're, because they're volcanoes at the top, they're ash. And when you stop, you actually slide backwards. You have to keep moving forward. And that's what Paul is talking about. You've got to keep moving forward. And as you move forward, you're growing more in him and you're learning more about who he is. And that's what he's talking about in this, in, this, in this verse. So he goes on, he says, all of us then who are mature should take such a view of things. If you are mature in your faith, if you're growing in your faith, your desire is going to be, I always want to be more of who God says I can be. I want to grow in my faith. I never want to get to a point where I go, I got this. We never get to that point in our faith. There are certain things about God that we have firm and confirmed and we know this for sure, but we're never going, yeah, I got all I know that now is all I need to know. There's always more that we can learn. So Paul says, that's how your mature view should be. And then he says, and if on some point you think differently, that too God will make clear to you. And I love this. It's like kind of a jab from Paul. He's like, hey, if you don't agree with me on this, don't worry, God will show you you're wrong. So only let us live up to what we've already attained. Join together in following my example, brothers and sisters. And just as you have, have, as, have us as a model, keep your eyes on those who live as we do. Paul's basically saying, follow my example. So this is an interesting, uh, what, what's fascinating, I think, is this line right here. Only let us live up to what we have already attained. So the next year, after I had my failed attempt of Kilimanjaro, that same college pastor said, I'm going to go climb the highest peak in Europe which happens to be Mount Elbrus. It's not Mount Blanc. A lot of people think it's Mount Blanc. It's Mount Elbrus, which is actually in the Caucasus Mountains of Russia. So that next summer, we flew to Moscow, met our team, and we flew down to Mount Elbrus. It's just right next near Chechnya and Georgia border there. It's a whole different kind of a mountain to climb because the whole thing was covered with ice year round. And I was, once again, not prepared. I did not have the right gear, but fortunately we had a guide named Boris. And Boris, he saw that I was not prepared. So he got me an ice axe and he got me these spikes for my boots called crampons. Listen carefully, crampons. And you put, like when you're walking, you stomp them into the ice and it's, it locks in, Frank, locks in to the ice. My good buddy, Frank, he, he's laughing at me and I love him. So anyway, so as you're hiking, you're, you're clamping in because the real, the real danger here is this is pure ice. In fact, the team before us, a guy had already slid off the mountain that year. And as you're hiking, if you lose your footing, you will slide off. So Boris, 
He's, he got up one morning, he said, you must be, he was Russian, right? He's like, you must be very careful. I will go ahead and you only take the steps I have taken. And so Boris would lead the way and he'd go up to the top of a, of a, a stretch and he would hammer in an ice anchor. And then he would come back and he would set another anchor down here. And then we would all tie into the anchor and Boris would lead the way with the anchor. But the goal was this. We never wanted to slide back past where we had already come from. And that anchor we put in the ground is what kept us from doing that. And there comes a point in your Christian walk, multiple points, I believe, where you have a small victory in life and God helps you get a victory. But the goal is to always live up to what you've already attained. So you need to put a figurative anchor in the ground and say, you know what? I've got this beat and I'm never going back. But the danger is you could always slide back into what you had before, what caught you before. So the goal is to put these anchors in. Here's what an anchor looks like. I had a friend. He really struggled with pornography. I was texting him one day. Couldn't get a hold of him. Couldn't get a hold of him. Finally, I called him. And he's like, oh, you can't text me anymore. I'm like, why? He goes, I got rid of my smartphone. He got a cheap little $40 flip phone. Drove me crazy. I couldn't text him. I had to actually call the guy. And he said, but listen, I'm so determined to be pure and clear from porn and I want my marriage to be solid. I got rid of my phone. So his anchor in the ground was, even if it's irritating to everyone around me and a little bit more work for me, I'm not keeping anything around that would cause me to fall into temptation. Talk to other people. My dad was one of them. He had a, grew up with a raging alcoholic father. And so dad's rule was we don't have alcohol in the house. He wasn't super legalistic about it, but he just knew we got that in our bloodline. We're prone to that. He kept alcohol out of the house. That was the anchor that he drew, drove into the ground. And he looked at everybody else and he said, there's nothing wrong with you doing it. But for you, it's okay. It's not okay for us because it's a danger we have. And I don't want to, I want to live up to what we've already attained. I want to keep going further in the faith and I'm not going to slide back. And for every one of us, there's some areas in our life where God's going to give you a victory and you need to be really careful once you get that victory to hammer an anchor into the ground. But the next thing you need to do is you need to keep an eye on the people that are around you. We had Boris, he was up front, but we felt extra safe because you know who the person was that was last in the line here? It was a girl named Oksana who that year was the world's, she was from Ukraine and she was like the best ice climber in this world championship in Ukraine. Top of the not, top notch ice climber. So in front of us, we had an amazing person. Behind us, we had an amazing person. And I think this is a good picture of what we need to have in our lives where Paul says, hey, you know, you need to like, Follow these people who are living by this example. Jim Rohn, he said this, you're the average of the five people you spend the most time with. Most of us, I think we think we're probably the smartest in our, in our group of friends, right? We don't say it out loud to our friends, but we know we're just a little bit smarter than everybody else, right? It's not the fact. The fact is you're about in the middle of your friends. In fact, if you are the smartest in your, people, uh, in your, in your friend group, if you are the smartest person there, you need to find another group of friends, because they are not pushing you to grow and become all you could be. You need to have people around you that are pushing you a little bit, and then you need to have people that you're helping pull in behind you, all the while seeking to push ahead and go together up higher. And that's where Paul, I think, is talking about. He, he follows up and he says this. He says, I've often told you and before, and now I tell you again, even with tears, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction, their God is their stomach, and their glory is in their shame. Their mind is set on earthly things, but our citizenship is in heaven. And we eagerly await a savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his in glorious body. I think what he's saying here is you need to make sure that the people you're climbing and hiking with have the same values as you. You need to make sure the people you're surrounding yourself with are going in the same direction as you. This, this, ver, this thing here, he says, their, belly, their God is destruction. One verse says, their belly, is, or, their belly is, uh, is their God. Their God is their stomach. Basically, I think that's saying that people who are obsessed with pleasure and indulgence, that's a path to destruction. If you're just going after every pleasure and indulgence, the world tells you to do that, but that's the path to destruction. And if you've got friends who every time you hang around with them, you find yourself stepping back into old things that you afterwards the next day go, oh, I shouldn't have done that. Oh, I shouldn't have talked about that. Oh, we shouldn't have gone there. You're hanging around with people that are dragging you away from the destiny God has for you ahead. And this is where Paul's saying, you've got to make sure that your people that you're hanging out with have the same values as you. Now, does this mean we just need to separate ourselves completely from the world and not hang out with anybody that has different views than us? Absolutely not. But you should not have people in 
your core group of people? Did you not have the same spiritual values and aims as you? Because naturally you are going to be dragged down by them. In fact, this is what Paul says here. He says this, don't be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. A guy told me this week, he's like, my son, man, he's such a smart kid, but he just hangs around with these people that constantly get him in trouble. And I'm like, then he's not a smart kid. You may be super smart, but if you're hanging around, listen, if you want to fly like the eagles and you're hanging around with turkeys, you're going to end up being a turkey. And everybody tells you you're an eagle, but you're hanging out with turkeys. I'm sorry. Potential is nothing until it's activated. And it doesn't mean we go, oh, you know, all these people are, they're, they're lowly or worse than me. No, the fact is there are going to be some people in your life that you need to keep in your life, but they need to be seen as a mission field, not as your mentors. Because bad company corrupts good character. So the question I'm asking is this, who are you climbing with? Think about it for a second. Who are the people that you give the most time? And it's hard sometimes because sometimes you're at work with people and you're like, I just, the people I'm working with, they're horrible people. And they drag me down. Listen, you may need to consider getting a new job and trust that God's going to honor that. Don't do it. Just don't jump to the gun. Seek wise counsel. Pray. Talk to advisors. But the bottom line is, if, they're, if the people that hang, you're hanging around with are keeping you from growing spiritually, you need to do whatever it takes to drive that stake in the ground and go, uh-uh, I can't get dragged back to that. I had a friend that she got clean from addiction. And... Um, about six months afterwards, she's like, I'm going to go to college. And she got accepted at this college. And it was in a town that I was like, that is not a good town for you to go to, based on what I know about your addiction. She's like, yeah, but I'm clean. God delivered me from that. Six months, she went up there. And just like, just a few months in, she was right back in the addiction. And she had told me one time, she's like, I just want to go minister to those people that were struggling with the same addiction as me. But listen, don't lie to yourself. That's what Paul's saying. Bad company corrupts good character all the time. Amen. And for some of you, you have a heart for the people that live in what you just came out of, you have no business right now being the, minister, the voice of ministry to them because you're not ready yet. You need to get stronger right now that the draw to it is still too strong. And what you need to do is you need to trust God's going to send people to your friends, but you're not the one that needs to go to them. And you're hanging around with them and you're invariably going to be dragged down by them because you're just not strong enough to resist that temptation and that tide. But, tr but listen, God will bring the people to them, but you need to stay clear of that as best as you can. And again, those people, they may have been great for you back then, but there are seasons of life where the people that used to be with you, the people that just because you have a past with them doesn't mean you, they're supposed to be in your future. And you need to love them. And this is what's really challenging, okay? Um, you know, I grew up pretty poor. <laughs> and when you grow up in poverty, there's this whole mindset you get with it. And one of the mindsets of poverty is you don't have any money, so relationships are your most important capital, right? Because you go, well, I don't have money, but I've got family, and family will always bail me out. So you say, you always end up bailing out family members, even if they're doing bad stuff, because you're like, well, one day they may need to bail me out. And so it's a beautiful thing that relationships are the most important capital you have, but the negative downside of it is oftentimes we stay connected to people and family that actually are holding us back from all God has for us. But we get afraid because we go, man, if I cut them out of my life trying to go where I need to go and I get in trouble, who am I going to have? And you oftentimes have family members and friends that when you say, I just can't be around them anymore. And they're like, what, well, do you think you're better than us? You think you're better than us now? You holy roller, Jesus loving person. Who do you think you are? And it's really difficult because you want to go, listen, you do your thing. I don't think I'm better than you, but I've got to get around people that have the same vision for life that I have because invariably you're going to become like those you hang around. And you can love those people at a distance. And there may be some people that were great friends for years with you. They grew up with you, but they're actually holding you back from all that you could be. And this is where Paul says this, or uh, uh, Solomon says this, excuse me. Whoever walks with the wise becomes wise, but the companion of fools will suffer harm. About 10 years ago, I realized because I grew up poor, I didn't understand how money worked. Money, there's, a, there's like literally like a, a whole knowledge base to how money works. So I started finding guys that knew, understood money. I read a lot of Dave Ramsey books and I read a lot of books about investing. I slowly started to wrap my mind around it. When we finally got our property in Kerrville um, about three years ago, one of the guys that I had brought into my circle and he had, he's just been a tremendous blessing to me, uh, my friend Jeff, he 
I met him when I was leading a bunch of wealthy hiking guys, hike, wealthy guys out hiking. And I met him. I was like, I really like the way this guy thinks. And he's super generous. So I started quizzing him and asking him things about, you know, what do I need to understand about money? And when we got this property, I was like, you know what? I need to ask his take on this. And this is really important, okay? Because a lot of times what happens is we make our decision and then we ask people's opinion about it. I have so many people come up to me like, hey, Joel, Joel, I'm going to marry this guy. I think God told me to do it. What do you think? I'm like, well, don't ask me. God already told you. Like, what does it matter what I think if God told you? You make your decision, then ask your advice. And I've learned you don't do it that way. That's the way you do stupid stuff. So I said, Jeff, come out and look at my property. What do I need to do with this? My dream is to put my dream home on this. And then we want to build a retreat center. He got on the property. He always called me guy. And he goes, guy. You got to get the emotion out of this. I know you want that dream home there. I know Emily wants that dream home. You cannot build the house first and then the retreat center. The retreat center's got to come first and you live in one of those little houses until you guys get some money going and then you build your house. And it was devastating because we wanted that house so bad. But the reality is we couldn't do it with the money we had and the finances we had. And man, I am so glad I listened to Jeff because he understood stuff I didn't understand. And I would have made some dumb financial decisions. Jeff stepped in. I told Emily about it. And she's like, that resonates with me too. I, I, we have to put our dream on hold, but it was the right decision. I'm so grateful I listened to Jeff because he's wise with money. When I have parenting issues, the best parent I know is my dad. I mean, look how good I turned out, right? No, just kidding. <laughs> I go to people that I say, man, when you have parenting issues, you find people who got the parenting thing down. You find those people, you walk with them and you'll become like them. But if you're hanging out with fools, the invariable thing is you're going to go to the lowest common denominator. So there are people in our lives that, man, you're just going to have to love them from a distance. And they may have been a great part of your past, but that was for a season. And here's what will happen. Oftentimes, you'll decide I'm moving on and I'm changing. And they'll cut you out and they'll get mad that you're cutting them out. If they cut you out when you're trying to improve yourself, there's a sign that they were never for you in the first place. And it hurts to acknowledge that. Until you acknowledge it, you're not going to be able to move forward in truth. I got a chance a few years later to reclimb Mount Kilimanjaro, and I was like, I'm going to get to the top of it this time. So I decided I was going to assemble me a really good team. And I invited a guy that I love, a guy named Bob Goff. He's a friend of mine, and he came and climbed with me. Most encouraging man I've ever met, most encouraging man I know. And Bob climbed with me in a team, and the whole way up, it was pure encouragement. None of us were in competition. <laughs> None of us were like, oh, that loser over there, he's not going to make it. It was all like, man, we're all going to make it to the top. And sure enough, we did. We got to the top of Mount Kilimanjaro. And I realized so much of it depends on the people that you've got around you. God has great plans for you. He has a huge plan and a purpose for you. But you, many ways, determine how far you get based on the people that you choose to bring into your circle and surround yourself and give your time to. And it sounds so unloving to say that some people need to go. But the reality is some people need to go. And you can love them still, but say, I'm going to love you from a distance. And sometimes it's family members. But you say, my goal is to become all God wants me to be. In fact, there's this one really uncomfortable verse where a guy says, Jesus, I want to follow you. And Jesus says to him, all right, come on. And the guy said, well, first, let me go take care of some stuff with my family. And he says, no. He says, those who put their hand to the plow and look back, aren't worthy of the kingdom of God. So he's basically saying, you've got to let the family relationships go and love me more than the family relationships if they're holding you back. And you can love those people, but you've got to move on. Now I realize it's very hard to make friends once you're an adult. Have you noticed that? Most of us, we just have to settle for the parents of the friends our kids make. <laughs> Awkward laughter. And your wife is like, hey, they're coming over again. And you're like, ah. Oh. Great. All right, here we go. It's hard to make friends, right? So I started thinking like, okay, if you're going to pick your friends and you got to just pick your friends, what should you be looking for in a friend? You're looking for somebody that's got the same vision for life, same passion, right? Maybe not the exact same things, but they've got a heart for God is the most important thing. And I, what, the verse that came to mind was 1 Corinthians 13. It's talking about love, but I think this is a good picture of what you should look for in a good friend. It says, love is patient and kind. It's never jealous or envious. That's a good question there. Everybody's got friends who are there for them when they're struggling. But do you have friends who are there for you when you're winning and they rejoice in your winning? And they go, man, after all the bad stuff that's happened to you, 
you're winning and I'm super excited for you. Do you have friends that can rejoice with you when you rejoice? My brother, man, he is tremendously successful. His books have sold many thousands of copies more than mine have. In fact, when I go speak at churches, everybody's like, mom, are you related to Jonathan? I'm like, yeah, that's my little brother. A lot of people ask me, are you jealous of your little brother? I'm like, absolutely not, man. That guy works his tail off and he deserves everything that God has blessed him with because he's been working faithfully hard. But how many of us, we have friends that they love it when we're fallen and they love to be there to rescue us. But when you're having victory, are they there for you in the same way? Do they rejoice that you're having victories? Are they jealous? They're never boastful or proud, never haughty or selfish or rude. Love does not demand its own way. You have a friend that it always has to be their way. You always have to go to the restaurant, the place they want to go. We all have one family member that's that way. It does not hold grudges. Got the friend that cuts you off for days when you get them mad, doesn't talk to you, or waiting for you to text them endlessly and see it until you apologize and grovel enough. It, even, it hardly even notices when others do it wrong. It's never glad about injustice, but rejoices whenever truth wins out. If you love someone, if you're a friend to them, you'll be loyal to them no matter what the cost. You will always believe in him, always expect the best of them, and always stand your ground in defending them. Now you go, wow, how do I find a friend like that? You ready for this? Here's how you find a friend like that. Be that person. Because like attracts like. The more you become that, the more people are going to want to, they're going to be attracted to that and they're going to be drawn to that and who you are. That's why millionaires end up hanging out with millionaires because they've got the same kind of vision for their lives. Like always attracts like. And if you're looking around and going, man, why do I keep attracting losers? <laughs> Maybe there's some work you need to do. Seriously. Like you got to get honest about yourself. Maybe you need to look at this and go, am I not patient or kind? Do I need to work on maybe I'm jealous or envious? Maybe I'm boastful or proud. When you become those things, you naturally, people will gravitate to you that are that, and you will find these relationships that are mutually beneficial. You're blessing them, they're blessing you, and you're raising each other up. And listen, there are always going to be people who are going to be project friendships. Just make sure they're not the core of who are the people that you're spending your time with. The core needs to be those people who are encouraging, like Paul says, people who are living out the example that Paul lived so that you can see that example and live that way because you're going to become like those you hang around with. There's no way other way around it. So my prayer for you guys is that, that you will live up to what you've already attained. And the way you do that is making sure that you're very careful about who you're climbing with. And it may mean some relationships need to be kind of go by the wayside. They were great for your past, but they're not part of your future. And you don't have to do it mean or haughtily. Because remember, love doesn't do it haughtily. You just quietly say, nope, I'm going to go a different direction. And if they comment on it, you can say, yeah, I'm just, I got some new focuses and values. And if they can't celebrate with those new focuses and values for you, there's your sign. They probably weren't part of your future anyways. Because they're going to want to rise with you. And the goal is that we're all rising together, hiking together, climbing together, watching out for each other, taking care of each other, and rising to the levels that God says we're capable of. And a lot of times you get in circles of friends and you feel like they're pushing you. And you go, I hear people a lot of times say, oh, they, they were judging me. Maybe they weren't judging you. Maybe they saw greatness in you you couldn't even see in yourself. And you ran away because you were afraid they were going to push you to be more than you thought you could be. But they saw it in you. Rise up and become all that they believe you can be because that's who God says you could be. It's even more than what your friends think you could be. Exceedingly, abundantly, far above all you could ever ask or think according to his power working inside of you. You guys receive that? All right. Lord, we thank you this morning that you are the one who has a purpose and plan for us. I thank you, God, that you're guiding and directing our steps that the path of the righteous is like the light of dawn that shines brighter and brighter. And I pray for those this morning that are realizing, man, they've got some people in their life that are not, they should not be part of them in their next season. I pray you give them wisdom on how to separate themselves from those people and move on and lovingly, just lovingly move on from those people, still showing love, but moving on to all you've called them to be. I pray for those that maybe in the past have felt rejected or hurt, or maybe they're feeling unlovable. I pray, Lord, that you would just Help them to see, Lord, that because of your power working in them, they can be more than they think they can be. For those who have a deep sense of insecurity and like, I don't think I could even attract those kind of people. Lord, I pray that you'd show them your love for them. They would see their value comes not from how they feel about themselves, but about how you feel about them. And in that confidence, Lord, they would rise up and become all they can be. I thank you, Lord, that you are guiding us and directing us. You who began a good work in us will be faithful to complete it. So I just pray for wisdom for everyone in this room and for great relationships to form around them. 
If you're here this morning, you've not started your relationship with Jesus. You already know who you are. You've been feeling it as I've been speaking. This is the first step. We're going to say a prayer in just a second. If you say this prayer and you mean it in your heart, God is going to come and transfer you out of the kingdom of darkness. He's going to forgive all your sin. He's going to set you up with him in eternity. If it starts with saying this prayer, let's all say it together. Lord Jesus, we repent of our sin. We turn from our way. We turn to your way. Help us walk in your truth. Amen. Hey, if you just said that prayer, welcome to the kingdom of God. We got some resources for you. They're under the do it again sign. My prayer for you guys this week is that you will rise higher, go further than you could ever imagine. I pray the Lord, man, hey, if you want friends, this is a good place to find them. There's a lot of like-minded individuals right here in this church. Find those people and you'll rise together. Be blessed. Have a good week. If you are ever in the Seguin area, come visit us on Sunday mornings at 9 or 11 a.m. Or you can just download our app and receive our weekly messages right to your phone. Just text CC Seguin to 77977 and click on the link that you receive. May the remainder of your week be enriched with God's favor and blessings.